Okay. We are... So, it, it wasn't last time, but let's pretend that it was last time that I talked to you guys about the ring of formal power series. So, I was, I was describing how it is that we're really doing our operations with generating functions uh, in that algebraic context of, of the ring of formal power series. Mm. And then I talked a little bit about how um, even though formally we're doing things in the ring of formal power series, it's, it's often useful to kind of bring in analysis um, to prove our algebraic things. Um, and also the one thing that I mentioned earlier that we are not going to be doing in this class is that it's also useful after you have the generating function to then go back to analysis and use it, uh, for example, to give, I don't know, like if you have the generating function for a sequence a1, a2, a3, etc., then uh, complex analysis has many tools for est estimating how big a, a sub n is. So like if you want to find asymptotic formulas for, for approximately how many ways there are of doing something, then complex analysis helps you. Um, and uh, again, I want to mention that because I want to make you aware that, that there is a, a whole branch of combinatorics called analytic combinatorics that uh, some of you uh, will probably be interested in exploring, and, and so you should explore it. Um, what I want to do today is kind of bring back the, um, the idea of, of doing uh, uh, formal computations in the ring of formal power series and just thinking about what those computations mean combinatorically. And so what I want to show you is that when we are computing things formally with generating functions, there, there's often a picture in, that you can have in your mind of what's going on combinatorially. And this will help us to just kind of look at a formal power series and, and understand where it counts just kind of by, by inspection, as mathematicians like to say. Um, and so I guess I entitled this the combinatorial meaning. of uh, the operations on ordinary generating functions. Okay. And I should say that what I'm what I'm going to be talking about today is not written in the book in this way. Um, I'm using partly the book of uh, Flajolet and Sedgwick on uh, analytic combinatorics. And uh, there's other treatments that maybe I, I will post on the, on the course blog of where you can read about this. Um, but OK, so let, let me just kind of introduce. So what I wanted to do is, is start by introducing some formalism. But I think everything will just become clear when we talk about the examples. But, so let me define a combinatorial class of objects. Um, it's going to be a set A together with a size function, which maybe we can denote like this. Okay, so like absolute value. And this means the absolute value of whatever thing you're putting in there. Uh, and let's say that the size of each element in the set is some natural number. Okay? But this should be such that such that the number of elements of weight n is finite for all n. Okay? So, you know, you could think that a, this could be the combinatorial class of partitions. And maybe the size is just, you know, the, the size could be the, the number of parts of the partition, or it could be the total sum of the partition. That's an example. Or a combinatorial class could be compositions. Or it could be finite sets. It could be, it could be many things, OK? Um, and so given a combinatorial class, let's let a sub n be the number of elements weight n, and let's define the generating function to be just the sum from n equals 
zero to infinity of a at x to the n. Actually, I'm going to try to use z instead of x today, so please remind me when I don't. And the only reason that I want to use z today is that I'm going to write x for product. And I don't want you to get confused about that. Um, OK. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll just come over here and write some examples. Um, so for example, we could let w be the class of binary, finite binary words. Okay, so it could be the empty word, or 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. Okay. All, the, all the words that have zeros and ones as letters. Okay. Um, if I want this to be a combinatorial, a combinatorial class, then I need to define the size. And the size of a word is just going to be the length. <coughs> okay. And so then we will see that uh, the number of words of length n, we know is just 2 to the n, right? And the generating function, in this case, is the sum of 2 to the n, x to the n, which is the sum of 2x to the n, or 1 over 1. Z. Z, thank you. Oh, Z. I'm going to keep doing it the whole class, so please stop me each time. And also, I don't want you to confuse the Z's and the 2's, so if I don't cross my Z's, also let me know, because there's a bunch of 2's in class today, I think. Okay, so that's, that's kind of, that's the kind of thing that you should have in mind. Uh, and it could be a lot of other things, right? Graphs, finite graphs, finite trees, finite posets. Matroids, just to, you know, whatever thing you know that it belongs in combinatorics, you can more or less uh, fit it into this context. Okay. Uh, let me just kind of, kind of introduce some boring examples that are boring but useful. So here's a combinatorial class. The only thing that it has is the empty set. This is the only set in it, and we declare that the empty set has size zero. Okay. And so what is the generating function here? Well, it's just you only have things of size zero, there's one of them, and so you get one times x to the zero. One times z to the zero, which is one. Okay. Boring, but often we need trivial things like this in in the algebraic, algebraic structures that we build. Another one that's boring is to do the same thing, except that now the empty set is declared to have weight 1. Okay. In that case, the generating function is that you have one element of weight 1, and so it's 1 times z to the 1, so that's just z. Those are just some boring examples to uh, to trivial examples, and then this is more the kind of stuff that we we, we should be thinking about. What is the notation you use before the second empty set? Oh, this thing. Yeah. What is that? This is my pathetic attempt at a. Is this called eta? Oh, no. What is this called? Let me try to draw better. Oh, that is eta, right? Zeta. Zeta, zeta. Oh, yeah, it is, it is the one that's really awful. It's like this, right? Yeah. Anyway, whatever it is. <laughs> zeta. Um, OK, so so here's something. And now we're going to try, try to define some operations on combinatorial classes.
So, we can add two combinatorial classes. And uh, this is just going to be the union of A and B. Okay? So, in other words, if this is graphs and this is sets, then the elements here are graph and sets. And what is the size of something? Well, if it's a graph, it gets the size from here. And if it's a set, then it gets the size from here. So you just inherit the, the size function. Inherit, inheriting the size from A and B. So that's one operation. The next operation is the product of two combinatorial classes. And this is going to be the set of things that we will write like this, alpha, beta, where alpha is in A, and beta is in B. Okay? And here, the weight of alpha, beta, going to be the weight of alpha plus the weight of beta. Okay? So that's so that's another operation. And then the third one that I want to introduce is sequence. So if I have a combinatorial class A, then I'm going to define a combinatorial class sequence of A, which is just going to consist of the sequences of things in A. In other words, it's either the empty sequence, okay, which we call it like this to uh, use our notation of combinatorial class. Okay, So either it's the empty thing that has no weight, that has weight 0 rather, or it's something in A, or it's something in A followed by something in A, or it's a sequence of three things in A, etc. Okay? And the weight is, is inherited from these two things, right? So. Again, I think this is going to be clear in in, uh, in an example. So maybe let's go over here and let's do some examples of what these operations look like in some cases of interest. Enrico, yeah? will we talk about what happens when you perform operations on these classes? Um, what happens to the generating function? Yes. Okay, just one right here. Yeah, so Chris is anticipating where I'm headed, which is that uh, when we perform these operations, then the generating functions behave very nicely. Actually, you can kind of guess what they correspond to, given the names that I, that I gave them, at least the first two. So let's do some examples. So W. How can I express W in terms of these operations? Well, the things in W, by definition, are sequences. They're sequences of zeros and ones. And so W is going to be a sequence of a combinatorial class. And that combinatorial class is going to consist of 0 and 1. Right? Where what is the weight, sorry, what is the size of 0? I mean, I'm, I want this to be a combinatorial class. right? This is going to be a combinatorial class, and so it means it should be a set together with some sizes, right? And so what should I define the sizes to be? Well, actually, I have complete freedom because the, com the definition of combinatorial sequence is combinatorial, what did I say, combinatorial class is, is completely open. But what is the, the useful thing to do is to define these guys to have weight 
one. And why is that? Because that way, every time that you have a letter, it has weight one. And so then when you, I don't know, if you look at this sequence of two ones, then the weight of that is the weight of the first one plus the weight of the second one. Right? So you're going to get the length as your weight. And so I need to get, I need to force these, these sizes to be one if I want the size nw to be the length of them. Okay. So this is an example of the sequence operation. Okay. So that's w. What about compositions? How can I write the how can I write compositions? Well, so remember a composition is just a an ordered list of numbers. And maybe it adds to something, but, but actually, if you don't know what it's a composition of, then it's just a, set of, a bunch of positive integers. It's just a sequence of positive integers. Okay. Now, the, the parts in a composition are positive. So it's going to be a sequence of integers that are not zero. They should be positive integers. Okay. So. You know, something in this is a sequence would be like two, two, four, one. Okay, that's that's a composition. Okay. Now I want for example, here's a composition. Right? What is the size of a composition for us? Well, what is the size of this composition? You kind of I have two natural choices, I think, but I think the more natural one is, given that we're talking about compositions, that the size of this is 12, which is the sum of the parts. Right? We say that this is a composition of 12. So if we want that, then what weights should we give to these numbers in, in this combinatorial class? The size of i should be what? i. So this has size 2, this has size 2, etc., and they're additive, and I get that. Now, and so compositions, again, are just given by, by, by this. Okay. I want to point out to you that I could choose a different size of compositions, and that would be a different combinatorial class. For example, I could say compositions where the size is the length. And if I wanted the size to be the length, then I would change these sizes to be 1. But I'm going to let the size be, the, be the, the sum of the parts, and so it's going to be like this. Okay. So compositions. What about multisets? Say multisets of the set this. Multisets of the numbers from 1 up to m. Well, what does that look like? A multiset could be something like 1, 1, 2, 4, 5, 5, 5. Right? That's a multiset of the number from 1 up to 6. Let's see. So how can I write this in, uh, in terms of these operations? Well, the multiset is given by a sequence of 1s, then a sequence of 2s, then a sequence of 3s, then a sequence of 4s, etc. So, sequence of ones <coughs> followed by a sequence of twos, etc. Then a sequence of threes up to a sequence of m's. Right? And again, remember. Times it does exactly this. It, it kind of concatenates the two things, which is exactly what I want to do here. Okay. Now, what is the size of this multiset? Well, multisets we actually just measure. You know, the size of a multiset is the number of elements: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So if we want that, then here we should let these guys 
have size one. Now let's talk about partitions. Let's say partitions where the parts are less than or equal to m. That m is some number. Okay. So what does that look like? Well, so it looks a lot like this. If I if I just change my frame of mind, this is a partition. Especially if I, I mean, normally we write partitions in decreasing order. So I might write it like this. That's a partition. So maybe I should do the same thing. Sequence of, and maybe just so that it's in standard notation, let me put the big numbers before the small numbers. Right? Um, now, what is the size of this partition? Well, again, it's a partition of 5 plus 5 plus 5, 15, 19, 21, 22, 23. Right. And so if I want that, then what weight should I give to these guys? The weight of I should be I. Okay. Question? Um, back to compositions, did you say that he could have a class with um, compositions and the weight being the length of the composition? Wouldn't that not be a class because you could have infinitely many compositions of a given length? Or You're absolutely right. So Kyla's point is that I said I could have done compositions where the size is the number of elements in my composition. But her complaint is that if I allow that to be the size, then there's infinitely many compositions of length 5 or even of length 1. And so for that reason, that would not be a, a combinatorial class. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I'm kind of glad that you brought that up because I wanted to bring up a subtlety now, now that you've seen some examples. Is this always a combinatorial class? I mean, do these always produce combinatorial classes? I think it's clear that if you have finitely many things of, work of size n here and here, then you have finitely many things of size n here. If you have finite, uh, finitely many things of each size here, then to have size n here, you need to have size k and n minus k. There's not, that, it, that's a finite number of possibilities. What about here? If you want to have something of size n here, here you might worry a little bit more because this is an this is an infinite sum in principle, and actually you can you can run into problems if a happened to have an element of size zero. Right? If a had an element of size zero, then I would have something of size zero here. Then that element a would have weight zero. Then a a would have weight zero. A a a would have weight zero, etc. So here maybe I'll put a little warning sign. that I shouldn't have no elements in A of weight, of size. You keep interchanging size and weight. Uh, no elements in A of size 0, if you want this to work. But don't we say the weight is a natural number? So you're including 0 as... So, right, so what I'm saying is that if you want this, this operation to be well defined, then you should only do it to a class that has no elements of size 0. Okay. So, yeah. That was like, like part of the definition of weight, that it couldn't be zero, right? Our weight can be zero. So actually, I, I didn't mention this, but I should mention it. Zero, for me, is a natural number. Okay. And it's, okay. it's actually kind of a debated topic. I think the consensus, both in Colombia and in the US, is that zero is a natural number. Uh, I, think in, I think, for example, in French, maybe zero is not a natural number. But anyway, zero is a natural number for us. Okay? And that's why I have to make this, this remark. Um, and you'll see that in all these sequences, I never have weights equal to zero. So it's okay. Okay, so 
Well, let's let's actually uh, write down the theorem that Krista is waiting for me to write, which is that what are the generating functions of these things? So what is the generating function for a plus b for the class a plus b? Well, you know, things come from a or from b, so it's like the plain addition principle. So it's this plus this. That's pretty trivial. What about this one? Well, if you trust the notation, probably this should be equal to a of z, b of z. Okay. And let me just give you a proof in words really quickly. If I want an element of weight of size n here, then I, like I said, I have to choose something of size k here, something of size n minus k here. So if there's a k of these guys and b n minus k of these guys, then the number of things of weight n is the sum over k of a k b n minus k. And that represents the convolution of power series. Okay. I'm saying it a little too quickly. If you're not so happy with it, think, uh, you should write down a proof. Um, what about the generating function for sequences? Well, it's a, it's a corollary of these two, but it should be 1 plus a plus a squared plus a cubed, etc. So you get 1 over 1 minus. Okay, so that's, that's the situation. And uh, actually, this allows me to bring up a fact about generating functions that I forgot to say last time, which is that if a of z is a generating function, let's say over the complex numbers, so it's a, so it's a formal power series with complex coefficients, when can I invert it? I'm in a ring. I, in a ring, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily able to invert things. Um, so 1 over a of z exists. In other words, a of z is invertible. If and only if um, a of 0 is not In other words, you can invert things that start constant plus other things. You cannot invert things that start with the z. Because 1 over z is not, it doesn't have a, a power series expansion, the ring of formal power series. So this is a, a, a nice exercise. It's an algebraic exercise, right? It's, it's describing the invertible elements in this, this ring of formal power series. But it, it has to do with this because you see here I'm taking the, the inverse of something, and I'm allowed to do it because I have 1 over 1 minus a of z, right? And notice that I don't have elements of size 0 in a, so a of z has no constant. a of z starts with z or something big. So that means that I have 1 over constant minus things that have z's, and therefore this says that this is inverted. Um, it's no surprise what the inverse is. I mean, the inverse is 1 plus a of z plus a of z squared plus a of z cubed, etc. Okay, so what, I, what I've done so far is pretty dry, I think. It's kind of some formalism. But what I want to show you is that these very simple ideas are enough to recover a lot of things that we've done so far and to do some new ones also. So let's put that to work over here. So so 
let's do some examples. Let's do those examples over there. I leave this for now. Um, so for example, W. What is W of Z? Well, actually, I just erased it, but and it was easy, but now it's even easier, right? Because W is a sequence of something, and so all I have to do is 1 over 1 minus the generating function for 0 and 1. Now, 0 has weight 1, 1 has weight 1. So we get Z or another Compositions. Again, this is a sequence. So I get 1 over 1 minus. And now I have to write the generating function for this blue thing. Okay. Actually, let me, let me do this in, in blue each time so that we don't get confused about it. So So what is the generating function for the for the blue thing over there? Well, I have my elements 1, 2, 3, etc. And they have size 1, 2, 3, etc. So I get z plus z squared plus z cubed, etc. And so this is easy to compute. I get 1 over 1 minus. This is z over 1 minus z. So when you when you carry this out, you get one minus z over one minus two z, and if you multiply this out, you'll see that this is sum of two to the n minus one z. Okay. And so this is a, a, a straightforward argument to, to show that the number of compositions of size n is two to the n minus one. We knew that, but okay. So it, it, it's very, it's very easy coming from here. Um, okay, let's let's do the next one. Multi sets, multi subsets of something of size m. So what's that? Um, okay. Well, I have a I have a product of things. Right? And so I'm going to get a product of things here. Big product of things. Now, what's the first one? Sequence of ones. Being a sequence, I get 1 over 1 minus whatever it's a sequence of. Okay? And here, I just have one thing of weight. One. And actually, all of, all of these guys are the same because all of these elements from 1 of 2m have the same weight. So I get this. Right. And so I get that the generating function for multi sets is 1 minus z to the minus m. And if you kind of if you remember how this goes, this is minus 1 to the n m choose uh, minus m choose n, right? Minus m choose n z to the n for n greater than or equal to zero. Okay. This is just kind of multiplying out. And so this proves, remember that we have the notation m multi choose n for this thing. This m choose n with double, with double parentheses. And so what this shows is that m multi choose n is minus 1 to the n times minus m choose n. This is what we call the combinatorial reciprocity theorem between sets and multisets. So again, it's not something that we did that it is something that we knew already, but, but it just comes for free from this format. Next one. So partitions into parts less than or equal to n. 
Again, it's a sequence of things, and so I just have to do each sequence separately. Okay. And I get almost the same thing, except that now the size of i is not 1, the size of i is i. Okay. So that means that I have 1 minus, so here I have one element of weight m, and in the previous one I have 0 to the n minus 1, 0 to the n minus 2, up to 0 to the 1. Okay? And so, again, this is just the, the generating function for partitions into parts less than or equal to m. Okay? And so, when I wrote this down, uh, you might remember that I, that I told you guys, you, you'll just get good at just looking at this and knowing why it's partitions. And... Uh, and maybe you can kind of see that now because you just know, okay, one over one minus this, right? So, uh, so, so what is this? This is the, gener the generating function for a, a product of m things, right? So something, then something, then something, then something. What is this? It's a sequence of m's. What is this? A sequence of m minus ones, etc. What is this? It's a sequence of ones. And this size is given by some of those numbers. And so you kind of get good at by just looking at this and by inspection knowing, knowing exactly what it means. So, okay. Um, maybe one example that I won't do, but I'm, I'm going to leave it to you as a an exercise is to prove the formula that I wrote down last time. I guess two classes ago I wrote this formula for the generating function of Stirling numbers of the second kind when k is fixed and n varies. And I told you that the formula looked like this. Okay. So if I write it like this, then that should that should begin to tell you kind of what's going on. This this looks a little bit like what we've done so far, and if you if you think about it in the right way, then you'll be able to interpret why you can just stare at this and you'll see that these are disturbing numbers. It's a little bit harder than this, which is why I leave it to you as an exercise, uh, because it'll it'll require a moment stop, but it, but it's a good exercise. And uh, here's a hint, is to see homework problem number one in this homework that I gave you. It's related to this question. So, okay, that's fine. But what else can we do with this? So far, it's kind of nice and elegant, but it's not giving us anything. Anything new. And let me show you something else that is not new, but that maybe will point us towards new things. So let me show you another example that we did. Actually, this is the first example that we did in class. So T is the combinatorial class of tilings or domino tilings. of rectangles of width 2. So here's one. Okay. 
How can you express this in terms of these operations? If you think about it, actually, there's a unique way of thinking of this as a sequence. A sequence of what? A sequence like this. You kind of look at the fault lines, right? The, the, the places where you can slide the tiling. And if you can call these pieces, if you call them the irreducible tilings, the, the, the ones that don't have a fault line, okay, so let's, let's call those T sub uh, irreducible, it's going to be the domino, okay, those tilings, those without what I'm calling a, a fault line, okay? These lines, which maybe is worth translating this to Spanish because, so when I say fault here, I mean fault like San Andreas fault, and like, and, and like a big hole in the, on the earth, something that's familiar in San Francisco and also in Colombia, they're both kind of earthquake places, but fault is falla in, the, in, in that sense. Actually, Colombia is also in the San Andreas fault, so I don't know if you guys know this. Um, but yeah, so so what I mean is tilings that you cannot cut, make vertical cuts on without making any, without cutting any tile in half. Well, what are the reducible tile tilings here? Either you start like this. And if you did that, then already that you can't put anything else because that'll be a that'll be a fault. Right? Or if you start with a horizontal tile, then you have to put a horizontal tile under it, and then you can't put anything else because that would be a fault. Now what I'm saying is that T, a tiling, is a sequence of irreducible tilings. Right? By the way, I guess I, I didn't say it, but what is, what is the size of a tiling? It's going to be the length. So what I mean by that is that if it's the tiling of a 2 by n rectangle, then it has size n. Okay. So if tilings are sequences of irreducible tilings, then what do I get? What I get is that the generating function for tilings is 1 over 1 minus, and I just say what the irreducible ones are. And it's this one that has z, and this one that has weight squared. And so this is this is where I actually alluded to this in, in my first class, and I told you that we would get to the point where we would just look at this and we would know exactly why it is counting time. If you get used to this enough, you you just you just know what this means and you know that it counts this. Um, okay. Any questions about that? Now let, let me let me remind you in case you forgot that this is the generating function for Fibonacci numbers, and uh, and so this proves that the number of tilings of the two by n board is the Fibonacci number. This is this is what we did in the first class. Okay. So that's a way of recovering some old results, but what about some new results? So let's say that we want to count the domino tilings of rectangles. 
angles of width 3. Okay. So what's the technique? Well, the same theory applies where if you, if you look at a tiling of a 3 by n, and if you just look at the fault lines and you cut there, then you're going to get a sequence of irreducible tiles. And so what I should try to figure out is what those irreducible tilings look like. So tilings of 3 by n's without vertical cuts. Without fault lines. So let's think about it. What, how can you make such a time? And I'm going to draw them in blue so that I remember that these are my reducible ones. Okay. Well, how do you start to tile a 3 by n rectangle? You have to put well, the, first, the first column has three cells. So you either put uh, three horizontals or one vertical and one horizontal. So, if you put three horizontals, then you're done, right? You can't do anything else because you have a vertical. You have a plot line right here. Whereas if you do this, and then you do this, and, okay, so then, then if I start with a horizontal and a vertical, then what else could I do next? Well, I can do one of two things. Okay, and so let me separate them. There's one more tempting one and one less tempting one. So the easiest thing to do would be to close it. And the other thing would be to go like this. Right? If I do that, this tile is forced. And what do I do now? Well, I have two possibilities, right? So either I go vertical or I go horizontal. So either I put down this vertical one or I put down another horizontal one. Okay? And if I do that, okay, maybe you see where I'm headed with this, then I'm forced to put a vertical. And then I just get this very clear sequence of what the reducible ones look like. Are those all the irreducible ones? No. no, because I also have the mirror images. But, but that's it, right? You're this or you're the mirror image. Mirror of this, mirror of this, mirror of this, etc. Okay. And I'm done. I mean, it's so easy. All of a sudden, these things. Uh, A problem like this one becomes very easy. If I want to find the generating function for tilings of a 3 by n, then it's a sequence of these guys, and so I just have to figure out what the weights of these guys are. Right? So 1 over 1 minus. OK. Well, you see, there's, there's nothing of length 1. The shortest one has length 2. And there's three of them, this one, this one, and this one. I have three tilings of weight of length 2. Then I have of length 4, I have this one and the mirror. Then length 6, I have this one and the mirror. Then 2, 3, 8, eight etc. And that's my generating function. Now, I can simplify this a little bit by saying that this is 1 over 1 minus z squared. So if I take out a z squared, then this is going to be a geometric series, which is 2 z squared over 1 minus z squared. And I just did this ahead of time, and I got that this is 1 minus z squared over 1 minus 3. 
almost seems unfair that we got this so quickly now. I mean, this 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 would have taken us a lot longer to do earlier. But this technique is very powerful for uh, for something like this. Okay. What do you notice about this function? What I what I erase here? Are you surprised by it in some way? I know it's a big question. No? One thing you might wonder is why only z squared appears. Why it's all about z squared. So what could that mean? Well, what that means is that the weight by the exponents are, are the lengths, right? And so what this says is that all, all these lengths have to be even. And actually, when you think about it, that's not surprising, because if you, have, if you want to tile, tile a 3 by n rectangle with dominoes, well, dominoes take up two cells, and so you have to do 3 by even. If you do 3 by odd, there's not going to be any tiles. So that's one reason that, that uh, only even powers of z appear. And you can also see that whereas these tilings were given by Fibonacci numbers, having to do with the golden ratio, because that's the root of this polynomial, here, what you're going to get are things like 1 over square root of 3. Those are the numbers that are going to appear for this kind of setting. Um, Realizing that I I wanted to show you a formula, except that I forgot to write it on my notebook. Uh, can somebody do me the favor of uh, going to the internet, go to my website, and look for this paper called Tilings? And I want, I want to write out the, the number of domino tilings. Of a two M by two M rectangle. So Chris is looking that up for me. Thank you. Um, so it should be some formula that, that looks maybe similar to, to what we're seeing here. Okay, so I'll show you that in a second, but another thing that I want to do is now go back to, to a problem that we did solve already, which is for the combinatorial class of dig paths, dike paths. Okay, so Here's here's a dike path. Thank you. I'm going to have to ask you to read this for me. This is <laughs> or to the m n product from i equals one to m product from j equals 1 to n of Sorry, cosine squared of uh, j pi divided by 2n plus 1 plus cosine squared of k pi divided by 2n plus That's the number of domino tilings of a 2m by 2m rectangle. This is one of one of the most amazing formulas in enumerative combinatorics. 
Um, what are we supposed to make of it? Do you think we can prove this formula with the technique that we just did? The, see, the, the thing is that in this technique, we're kind of relying on the fact that that the, that the thing is pretty narrow, so that we can enumerate all the tilings that have no no faults. But if you try to do this for like a hundred by n tilings, you're not really going to be able to enumerate all the irreducible tilings of all possible rectangles a hundred times something. So I think it's fair to say that this is this is not the method to prove a formula like this. And I kind of wanted to put that formula in front of you to intrigue you, to pique your interest, and to show you that there's a lot more to learn about putting balls into boxes. I mean, it's a very elementary problem. And that's the answer. It's just, it's just what the answer is. You don't get a nicer answer. That's, that's what the answer is. And so it, it begs for some explanation. But maybe but at this point, we should not be so surprised about cosines and things like this, because we are seeing things like the golden ratio, like square root of 3. And uh, these are the kinds of things that cosines spit out. So maybe that, maybe that part is not so surprising. Um, so yeah, this is part of a beautiful story. Actually, this is a theorem by a physicist originally, Castellane. And, uh, and the whole theory of enumerating domino tilings is really beautiful. And uh, if some of you are interested, I, I highly recommend it. It's very nice. And it doesn't belong to what we're doing today. It's really a, a different beast. Okay, so let's go to dike paths. So how can we apply this technique to dike paths? If you look at this dike path, then I hope by now you're thinking of it as a sequence of four dike paths. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So, what are the irreducible ones? Where by reducing, I mean cutting like this. Well, you're irreducible if you don't hit the x-axis except at the end. The irreducible means that you don't bounce. We never do this. Okay, what's what should be the size of a path? Well, it should be half the number of steps, right? If this takes two n steps, then we say that it has size n. N steps up, n steps down. So half the number of steps. Okay. So then what does our theorem say? Okay, well. First of all, D is just a sequence of i's. And therefore, D of z is equal to 1 over 1 minus i of z. Okay. So now what's i? I claim that I is equal to the thing that I cannot write times D. Remember, this is the empty set. I mean, it, it just has this ha just has one uh, one element, and that element has length one. So when you take a product of a one element set times D, you just get D. It's basically the same thing, okay? But what is the what is the length of i? It's one plus the length of d. Okay. And so what I'm saying is that if you just take this thing, you just just cut this off, okay. then you get a correspondence from irreducible paths black ones 
to this this thing right here is going to be an arbitrary diagram, which might or might not hit the bottom. Okay. And if the black one i has n steps, then the orange one has n minus one steps. So therefore, they're basically the same combinatorial class, except that the the length is off by one, which is why I need to multiply by this thing, which has length one. Okay. So then, what does this mean? Well, I get that I of Z is equal to whatever the weight of this is, whatever the generating function for this is, remember, it was just Z times D of Z. So what did I just get? I got that D of z is equal to 1 over 1 minus z d of z. Okay, and this is this is the the equation that we used to get d of z. We solve by the by the quadratic equation. We got that this is one, what is it, minus square root of 1 minus 4z over 2z. And we got Catalan numbers out of this. Um, and so you see, there's a, there's also this very clean procedure using using this language to to get count. So you see, basically, that this procedure that I'm showing you today is very useful, especially when you have notion of like you know what. When you're trying to count things that are like, they kind of naturally want to live on a line and are like sequences of other things. That's, I know that I'm, uh, that I'm not being very rigorous in that statement, but basically when you have things that want to live on a line and you have kind of natural ways of, of counting it into other things, that's when this technique works. Okay. So what I want to finish with today is by talking about another problem. Uh, what did I call it in my notes? I guess I just call it a number of permutations of n such that let's call them pi such that the difference between pi of i and i is always less than or equal to 2. Okay, So there are permutations that don't mess up things too much. If you take the number a, you can either send it at the farthest i, I plus 2 at the farthest i minus 2. It has to stay within 2. Okay. All right, so let's talk about one such permutation. Okay, And this could have the hope of working because permutations, at least in one of their incarnations, live on a line. But actually, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to draw the diagram of this permutation. Yeah. What kind of permutation is this? Notation? So this is one line notation, and now I'm going to write it in the in the kind of arrow notation, where I just say, okay, well, the number one goes to number three. Number two goes to number two. Number three goes to number one. Number four goes to number five, and five goes to four. Okay. And I, I want to still draw this on a line, and then I hope you see the fault line here, right? We're going to want to say that this is the sequence of those two irreducible ones. And so if I want to figure this out, Then I just want to, I just have to enumerate the irreducible pictures with this property. Okay, so what are the irreducible pictures? Okay. Well, let's start. Let's start increasing the length. So, for example, if a, if a picture has only one node, then the only thing it can be is like this, right? 
What if it has two nodes? Um, well, if I, if I don't want it to look like this, then this guy should go here. And if I only have two nodes, then this guy has to go back. What if I have three nodes? One, two, three. Well, there's, there's two cases. Either, either this guy jumps by one or it jumps by two. So first, let's say that it jumps by one. Okay. Then this guy shouldn't go back here because, because I would get a breakpoint. So then this has to go like this. And then I have to go back like this. That's one case. What's another case? Is that I jump by two. And then how are the other ones related? But one thing that could be is that I go like this and like this, which is like the reverse of this one. And so let me let me put this one and I'll put it here a reverse just to remember that that I can go like this or I can go the opposite direction. Is there anything else that could happen? You could actually just go back to like this. It has no fault. Okay. So I have three things of size three. Okay, what about size four? One, two, three, four. Again, let's do the two cases. Either I jump by one or I jump by two. So let's say I start jumping by one. Okay. Now, can can this guy jump by one? Well, if it did, this guy can't go back because then I would get this picture, which means that I would have to go further, and I would have to come back here. But this is more than size two. So, and that cannot be. So therefore, this is not allowed which means that this guy has to jump by two. Now, if this guy jumps by two, then this arrow has to return somewhere. It has to return by at most two, so it returns here or here. But this guy already has an arrow coming in. You can't have two arrows coming into the same thing because this is a permutation, which means that this guy has to go like this, and this guy has to go like this. Okay. And, uh, so this is if my first jump was by, by one. And if my first jump was by two, I encourage you to see that the only possibility is the reverse of this one. Here, there's this exception because I'm allowed with two. But that exception does not occur later on. Yep. Why could we not have like one going to three and three back to one and then two going to four and then Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, actually. Sorry. The, looking at my notes and realize that I miss exactly the picture that you're saying, which is that I, I can go by two, and then there's two cases. Either I get the reverse of this one, or this one. And again, I think you see what I'm doing, and the easiest way to be sure that I'm not lying to you is just to do it yourself. But uh, the argument is not any harder than I'm saying right now, and you'll see that these are the only uh, three possibilities for length four. And then from length five on, I claim that there's a, there's a unique picture, and it's reverse. Okay. So for length five, one, two, three, four, five, it's kind of, you keep doing the same thing. You jump by one, then you jump by two, and then you, you can't jump by two anymore, so you jump by one, and then you return. And uh, it's not difficult to see that this is the only possibility for five. 
that, that and it's reverse. For six, you kind of do the same thing. So you jump by one, then you jump by two, jump by two, and then you just kind of do what it takes. So you see what, what I'm doing is I start one and then two, two, two until I'm done. And here on the bottom I do two, two until I'm done. So in this case it's gonna be like this. And the reverse. But so my, my claim is that these are all the reducible pictures. For every size n greater than or equal to 5, I have two, which are this one and the reverse. And for the smaller values, I have these, these exceptions. And then again, you'll see that I'm done with the enumeration. The rest is just algebra. Because what I get from this is that an is the coefficient of z to the n in 1 over 1 minus, and I just have to list all these things. So let's list them. I have 1 z, I have 1 z squared, then I have 3 z cubed, I have 3 z to the fourth, and then I start having 2 z to the fifth, 2 z to the sixth, So we just have to compute this. But again, you see that this is a this is a geometric series. So I can just substitute this by two to z to the five over one minus z. And uh, you do it. I mean, I'm not asking you to do it. Uh, one does it. <laughs> this is not fun. I mean, a, a computer should do this. But what you get is 1 minus z over 1 minus 2z minus 3z cubed plus 3 over 5. And you can see that maybe this, this wouldn't have been such, a, such an easy thing to prove without this technique. And in particular, Remember that when we have linear recurrences, like, like we did for the Fibonacci numbers, this tells you what the recurrence is. Right? In the Fibonacci, we had 1 minus x minus x squared in the denominator, and that tells you Fibonacci n is equal to the previous 2. Here, what we get is that a n is equal to 2 a n minus 1 plus 3 a n minus 3 minus a n minus 5. For any and I encourage you to try to prove this by deck. Can I imagine it's not going to be so easy, right? It's not the most beautiful recurrence in the planet. Um, but it is interesting because if you actually want to compute this in practice, this makes it very easy. You have this linear recurrence, you can just do it, you can run it, and it's fine. Um, but I would argue that for a problem like this, actually, it's the general te algebraic technique. I mean, it's like an algebraic combinatorial technique. This, you know, this is part of what we call algebraic combinatorics. And it is this technique that really allows you to, to get a formula like this in the recurrence. So you had a question. Yeah, well, I, was, I guess I was wondering, you know, you were talking about some of these formulas in the early, or earlier in the class where you could just like look at them and read off exactly what was going on. And I was wondering, like, when you look at this, is this some, like, can you, can you read off where these are coming from or not? Yeah, so the question is, can you just read off this and, and know that it is? Not know exactly what combinatorial thing it counts? I, I would say, at least for me, no. I, I can't look at this and know what it is. If you show me this, maybe, I can, I can begin to imagine what it's about. Uh, but still, it's a bit of a stretch to go from that to those pictures. I mean, really, the way this happens is the other way around. It's more like you, you, you study the problem, and then this is where it, what it leads you, and then at least you can kind of look at the formula and understand where the formula comes from. I guess that's what I would say. So you said that you look at the denominator and you do the recurrence. Is that how you start? 
Yeah, so that's a good exercise. So here's a good exercise. If I mean, it's not even much of an exercise. I'll just tell you, I'll just show you why it's true. We have this formula, right? So if this is equal to, and, and this is true for whenever you have a power series, a generating function that is equal to a rational function. Whenever you have this, just multiply the, num the denominator by this, right? And you will find that this times this is equal to some very small thing. Right? And when you look at the coefficient of a of z to the n for n bigger than or equal to five, then on this side you see that it's a n minus two a n minus one minus three a n minus three plus a n minus five, and on this side you see that it's zero. And so this is a way of also reverse engineering recurrences from the power series. And it's if and only if. If you, have, if you satisfy a linear recurrence, then your power series is rational. And if your power series is rational, then you satisfy a linear recurrence. That was like the same thing as with partitions, right? You were able to get that recurrence relation for partitions from the... Yeah, very, very often you can just kind of reverse engineer recurrences from the generating functions, which is very useful. If you generalize the two to some constant, Less than or equal to n. Is there some easy? So it's a little bit like. These so the question is, what happens if I make this number? If I change it, you can imagine if I make it smaller, it's going to be an easier problem. Like if I make this one, it's going to be an easier problem. If I make it bigger, it's going to be harder. And it's a little bit like the tiling problem, where like if I ask you to do this for three, maybe you can enumerate all the possibilities where the jump is at most three. But if I ask you to do it for jumps of size at most 100, good luck. <laughs> and you need a different technique, and, that, and it's the same technique that enumerates domino tilings. Enumerates this. We have to go, but uh, I'll be around if you guys have more questions. <laughs>